So welcome back, everybody. Uh, it is the second to last week of class, which is pretty amazing. I don't know about you, but it feels like it's kind of flown by. Um, so this week, we are pretty much going to look at just doing training inside Runway. So we're just going to talk about a little bit about how StyleGAN works. Um, Lee and I are going to present a little bit about how GANs work, how to like sort of think about them. And then we're going to mostly do uh, today a demo of training inside of Runway. Um, if you've ever try to train anything, like maybe on a server or something, it's a little different, but um, there's just a couple little things we want to keep an eye on as we stuff. We do these things in Runway. Um, so next week, we are going to look at some more like advanced techniques once we've trained our model. We'll look at how to uh, manipulate them a little bit more inside of Runway. Um, and then I am obviously behind on scheduling one-on-ones. Um, I'm going to set that up this week. I will post a note in the Slack channel um, and people can schedule some time to uh, like talk with me or Leo one-on-one. Um, one thing to note about this is, so we, Lee and I have been discussing this, and I know, Moises, I know you were interested in this. Um, we've been thinking about an idea of sort of having like a uh, live stream of sort of like end of class projects if people are interested in doing something like that. So what we think we'll probably do is actually like we will finish um, our classes and then we'll pick a date sort of two weeks out after the end of classes. Um, if you want to schedule some like present stuff, you can do either present live or you could record a video and we can play the video. Um, and we'll maybe like do like a friends and family kind of thing and invite some people to come watch. Um, I think that'll just be a nice way to like sort of wrap up the class. And then we can also talk about sort of like what might you want to demo and then we'll give you a little bit of time to make sure that you actually have the time to do it because um, I know we've sort of been throwing a lot of stuff at you and you're going to need a little bit of time to sort of make a project that you want to present. Um, so we'll talk about that maybe more next week about like exactly when we should schedule some time to do that. And that's totally optional. We don't expect anyone to like want to present their work publicly like that is not the point of this class. Um, so if you are interested in sharing work, um, there's two ways to share it. We also have like our class, uh, our class webpage, um, which we're posting some work from what people post on the internet. Um, so you can share either like in that format, if you just want to write like a blog post or just search and then just Instagram, we're happy to share it that way. And if you are interested in presenting something like a five minute demo of sort of what you made during class or just something you found interesting, uh, we'll also do that as a part of this live stream. Um, so we'll talk about that more next week, but I just want to put that on anyone's radar that if you are interested in doing that, Maybe think about the project we want to present or just, you know, maybe like think about like a five minute uh, presentation at most. Um, so you can keep it pretty light and just sort of like share work um, and have sort of like a fun little end of class uh, get together. Cool. Okay. So uh, like Pat, previous weeks, we're going to do some breakout groups. It seems like people are having fun just sort of talking to each other and um, bouncing ideas off each other. So we're going to do a little bit more of that. So we is going to do our magic zoom breakouts. Um, and then we're just going to mostly do a lecture for the first half of class. Um, Lee is going to present about sort of how, what GANs are. Um, some of you might already know, but we're going to talk a little bit more in, deep, in depth about that. And then we're going to talk about sort of style GAM in particular and how to uh, think about training. And then after our break, we're mostly just going to do like a walkthrough of um, exactly how to train inside a runway. So it's got like a baking style demo where we've got some, stu some stuff ready to get re already set up. And I've got some other things I'll train live and then we can just sort of walk through how I would sort of think about doing your training process and how I would think about like looking at uh, your outputs and what to do after when you're done as well. Um, so we'll do that. Sound good? Awesome. Okay. So uh, I think it's breakout groups to start with. Is that right, Leah? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So um, yeah, I know you guys' homework last week was to uh, compile a data set. And so um, maybe you guys can talk about like how your process has been um, compiling your data set, anything you ran into, um, and I'll put you guys in breakout sessions, and then we'll all come back for a little discussion at the end. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Moving you guys now. Okay. I think everyone's back. Um, Leah, do you want me to share my screen, or do you want to start by sharing? Um, I can start by sharing, yeah. Cool. All right. That sounds good. Yeah. Or I guess actually we should have a conversation about what everyone talked about before we jump right into the lecture. Um, I'm interested to hear, like, what is everybody working on this week? And like, I know at least the group that I was a part of for a little bit said they learned a lot about how just how hard data sets are. I'm interested if that was a common thing with everyone else too. Anyone wanna discuss what they learned or didn't learn? So it's definitely time intensive. I mean, I, I, I found it easier to get better data sets by sort of researching what the relevant hashtags were, uh, the useful ones, rather than going for the broad ones, like the 
raw ones are just, it's just like too much. And then, so you have to kind of like figure out what subsets uh, of your like different sort of ideas or topics within the thing you want to uh, collect and then sort of grab those tags. And that gives you sort of like pure sets and you just compile those. That was a tactic I used. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that that's one thing you learn is that you think you like, oh, I'll just scrape 30,000 images from a hashtag. And then you go through them and you're like, wait, half of these aren't even the hashtag I was, that I was expecting. Like what, what happened here? Like, you know, people are like basically hashtag bombing with their posts or whatever to try to, you know, get more, more views or whatever it is. So yeah, it's really tough. And it's like the same thing happens on Google. The same thing happens with Flickr. Like you just start to realize that like, Human People made data. Attacking. Yes, human made data sucks. It's miserable. Um, yeah. It makes you uh, understand like why Google uh, has reCAPTCHA and all the I am not a robot. Like, and it makes me think like maybe there's a world where you know we could make it easy to leverage our friends to like rather than scrolling through Reddit or Pinterest or Instagram or whatever, like help your friend five minutes label some things. Totally. Yeah. Um, and actually, I mean, I think for a long time you know, when this stuff really started in sort of the late two, 2010s, like a lot of people were relying on like Mechanical Turk or whatever and like paying people five cents an image or whatever to like, you know, tell me what's in this image, like, or tell me if this is the right thing I'm expecting, that sort of thing. So yeah, I mean, this also like, this explains a lot of like, you know, we hear a lot, um, if you're in any part of tech scene, like you hear a lot about big data and like, this is what it is. And this is why there's so much money invested in making sure your data set is clean, making sure other things are like sorted the right way, like, you know, paying content moderators and other people to make sure things are like correctly tagged and labeled. And like, this is the, this is the work for a lot of people. So did anyone decide to make their own data set? I, I uh, know you were talking I about this a little bit. Tried. Yeah. Sorry, who's, who's I, saying something? Um, maybe me, I don't know. Yeah. I heard somebody else also. Um, I tried, um, so I tried to use, I don't know if anybody has used like Rhino and Grasshopper um, as far as architecture. So I tried to like generate a bunch of kind of random shapes and Boolean operations and then took screenshots of that. And um, I've, I've been unable to upload it onto Runway for some reason. It keeps crashing every time I try. I think it might be my, that I like converted to JPEGs or something like that or converted to JPEGs, so I don't know. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to kind of generate the my own language of the data set. Um, so, so far I've made 500 images. I'll see, oh. I'll keep going and yeah, see how it goes. Nice, April, I know you were making stuff too, right? You're making drawings? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to train it on my travel sketches, but they're not optimized for this. So <laughs> I, I really want to do it on a personal data set though. So the yeah. other thing I'm, I'm trying to scrape my like high school blog posts for like a text-based mm. one. Um, and I think I might have enough for that, but I, I definitely cool. want to do it from on my, my, my previous work. Cool. Um, I ended up, it wasn't this past week, but the week before I used a bunch of my own uh, photo slash like video stills and end up splitting that up into twos or smaller because they're all close to 4k and so I already trained that on a model last week and this week when I made my lamp uh, my lamp test I trained the lamps on my f my uh on the model that I made last week, if that makes yeah. sense. It's like the yep. lamps were trained on my own work, which was trained on like forest photos. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of like that integration of like, I know it's not completely my work, like to this week's data set, obviously it wasn't my work, but then you see the prog, like we see the progress images. It's like, you still see the, the painterly kind of quality in some of the generated images. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. It, that's basically a process called transfer learning. Um, and that's sort of like fundamental to Runway's training process. But we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, Moises, I know you were making a data set for yourself as well, right? Uh, it was all manual, finding the HTML link, getting it, oh, okay. saving. Uh, I would say that if you're going to go that way, 
if you know how to use Sublime and it can, you can get a few shortcuts in, stem, in terms of like deleting and like this is all pretty manual like I didn't like sort any expressions or anything right now I'm just like we talked about last week like I am a machine like I just been going at it this this whole weekend and I'm almost done with both of them I have a data set of 2000 logos of the highest grossing companies and like I just like that idea like the data set like whatever comes out of it to me is like an expensive logo like a trash expensive <laughs> logo like something about that and then the other one I'm doing is uh, banknotes so just like high res scans of banknotes from every country and that one like I'm interested in the GAN but I think eventually I'd like to do something with print where like I just print a bunch of like fake money in a in a, in a place and everyone just gets yeah all these weird like GAN money Cool. Just please don't get anyone arrested. But yeah, that sounds cool. <laughs> um, cool. All right. So that sounds good. We'll talk a little bit more about projects um, after our break. But I think we should jump into uh, doing a little presentation stuff. Right, Leah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, yeah. So today's class is going to be uh, showing you guys how to train um, your models in Runway. So I'm going to do a little rundown of how GANs actually train um, and the process they go through when they're training. Um, so what is a GAN? GAN stands for Generative Adversarial Network. Um, if you notice, it's called generative because it does generate new things. It's also called adversarial, um, which plays into how it's set up on the inside. So it's called adversarial because there are actually two networks inside of it that kind of work against each other or try to like uh, fool each other. One is called the generator and one is called the discriminator. The generator will be producing new images and it's the discriminator's job to try to tell whether the generator is um, trying to fool it or not when it comes to, um, it receives a new image and it's supposed to tell whether the image is real or fake, meaning like a forgery made by the generator. And so, an example of, uh, or an analogy of uh, the generator and the discriminator is a forger and a bank. So the generator in this case is the forger who like produces new forgeries. And then the discriminator is the bank whose job is to tell whether or not this is a real dollar or a fake dollar produced by the forger. So at first the forger, um, the generator in this case is really bad and it produces like really lo-fi um, images and then the discriminator will reject this immediately and be like no this is definitely fake and then the generator knows how to do better next turn in the training and then it might produce a higher fidelity mockup and then the discriminator might also um, might also get better and in this uh, in these various steps where um, the generator is producing better and better fakes and then the discriminator is getting um, uh, better and better at telling fakes, the fakes become more and more real looking and they converge to hopefully something that looks real, meaning from your training data set. Cool. Are there any questions on that? I have one yeah. One question. Where are both of them getting their data from? So you've got the generator and discriminator. Are, you, are they using the same data set to like build it? Like that's my, that's my question. Yeah, so the, um, yeah, they both have access to the same data set. The generator um, looks at the training set and tries to produce images that it thinks are like similar to or representative of the training set. And then the discriminator gets that and, or gets what is produced and has to be like, okay, I think this is a fake image, meaning made by the generator, or I think this is a real image, meaning it came directly from the training set. So they're both kind of like getting better at the same time on the same data set. So they're both like, I'm looking at this thing, and he's like, hey, I have one, and this one says, no, it's not, that's not right. Right, yeah. Okay. Exactly. All right, I got it. Yeah, and some models, I forget if StyleGAN does this specifically, but some get, for some models, the discriminator sees both fake and real images, and it's uh, being trained on whether or not it gets those answers right, right? So sometimes it sees a real image and it has to know whether that's the real or not. Um, yeah, so it's different, different GANs work slightly differently depending on that. Um, 
And then sometimes the way that they get smarter, so the first version of StyleGAN, which like we'll talk about a little bit when we get to StyleGAN one or two, the first version of StyleGAN actually used resolution as a way to sort of like start with very dumb like solutions, which is basically like it down res something to be like four by four, and then was basically guessing what a four by four pixel of an image should look like. Um, and then it built up resolution from there. Um, so there's different ways in which you can train the discriminator as well as the generator. But yeah, the idea is that they both have some idea of what the data should look like, and they're trying to generate something based on what they know about the current state of the data. Is there any advantage to trying to give them different data sets? Like, or is that, that I mean, because right now we're just kind of feeding one data set into the scan and it's coming out. So I'm, I'm curious how both of these two things are, are you know, processing that. Okay. Yeah, so one technique you can do, and we can talk about this more um, after we sort of talk about training, is like you could train a, the same sort of data set and throw out some things and see if that helps. Um, you know, there are different ways in which you could maybe sort of tweak your data set to see if there are ways to tweak things, whether you need to add more data or remove some data. Um, there's different ways to look at it. There's also just some randomness applied to a lot of these models. The way in which they learn is has some random elements in it. So sometimes you can retrain the retrain on the exact same data and it works and then sometimes it doesn't and it's just it's a little bit of just you find kind of find out and you maybe like after a while you sort of learn like okay this is too diverse of a data so this is not diverse enough like that sort of thing yeah cool okay i'm going to jump into a little bit about runway um so uh we we're talking about this i think in one of the small groups earlier is like is runway expensive or why would i use runway over Say, like, if you've seen any of my other videos, you know there's ways to train these models on some like paper space or on like a rented server like AWS or Google Cloud or anything. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about just maybe why you use Runway. Uh, so the first thing is Runway has a really nice GUI. If you don't know how to write code, uh, Runway is like, I think your only option um, or like one of very few options that you have available to you. Uh, we've also seen in this class that like the GUI is like very helpful to do certain tools. So there's lots of reasons why you might just like use Runway for the GUI itself. Um, and by the way, in case you don't know what GUI is, it's graph user inter interface. So instead of writing code, you're playing with things on a screen. Um, the second reason is it is really, really fast. Um, so when I train in my StyleGAN class, um, which Moises and uh, Fabiola are part of, like we train for days, whereas Runway takes hours. Um, and I think part of the reason why, with why that is, is like they spin up a really powerful uh, server behind the scenes to do training. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if they lose money while renting that server to give you uh, a really powerful GPU. Um, that's me speculating, but like it wouldn't surprise me. Um, so it is very, very fast and it's like pretty powerful for what you get. Um, and then the question of like, is this worth it? I actually do think it's a good bargain. Um, you know, when we, when we do this work in the StyleGAN class, it ends up costing us about 50 to $60 for something very similar to what you've spent 30 or 35 on for Runway. Um, now, I'll actually say like, I think the models you would train on, a, on like in our style game class are a little bit uh, better overall, um, but it's still like, it's pretty good. Like I'll actually say like a lot of times if I don't know um, if a model is really gonna work, I might just throw it in runway and like find out overnight, you know? Um, it's a little bit better than training for days on end and finding out that it ended up being crap. Um, so there's a lot of good reasons to use the runway style game model. Um, there and are some you... downsides, sorry, go ahead. Uh... Yeah. When you train, uh, how many steps are you training? Like, you yeah, know, so that's, runway. yeah, so that's a little bit there. The way that they train in, oh, so we'll talk about training in runway. Um, so I'll generally do 4,000 to 5,000 steps from doing a style again two model. Um, how that equates to, so like when we do training on servers, those don't really have steps. They have what's called K images and it ends up being about two or three times as the, uh, the amount, but it ends up being about the same quality level. Um, so it's kind of hard to like compare apples to apples there. Um, yeah. Um, is a step, is a step like each counterfeit bill that is being introduced? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. and I think they're doing some other work, like, on, they might be batching those, like you might actually be like handing 20 bills at once and it sort of like batches that process and then that's what it does. Um, yeah. So they have a little bit of a different model than like our other style game models that we work off of, but I, yeah, it is basically like a step is what they, what you would call a one forward pass and one backward pass. Um, if you know anything about machine learning, that's sort of the idea. But yeah, it's basically one, one step. Um, that's why they call it that. <laughs> uh, so the downsides to using Runway are that you have a lot less control. So in our class, like Moises could probably tell you, there are like 50 parameters you can change in a model to like slightly tweak things. Um, and you don't have those options Runway. 
Now I've heard that uh, from the runway folks, they do plan to add some options in the near future. Um, but for the moment, like you don't get to control whether images mirror, they just turn it on for you. Um, so in the case of stuff like text, like they're gonna automatically mirror your images and you can't say no to that. Um, there's also some stuff around, um, you know, learning rates or other things, which like we, we might get into a little bit later at class, but like you don't have control over everything within runway. Um, next is you can only have square options. So in my style guide class, I teach that you can do some vertical or horizontal images. Um, and there are some like uh, requirements to those, but like in runway, you only get square. Um, so you only train squares of 256 or 1024 or 512 if you want to do style again one. Um, third, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, is there are less pickle options. So you, you only can download a model at every 500 steps of your training. Um, inside of, if you were to train this on a server, you could set however many pickle files you want to download. Um, so you have much more fine grained control, but we'll talk about the fine grained like control and like I actually think that's not the biggest deal breaker. Um, and then lastly, Runway does archive all of your pickle files after a certain period of time, except for the one that you want to keep. Um, so we'll talk about that again at toward the end of the demo. Um, but it is helpful to remember that if you like certain things or if you like multiple steps within the model, you need to download those to make sure you don't lose them. I think it's two weeks you have to download those files. Um, so you do also like sort of give up some things uh, in Runway to like sort of like use their tools. So uh, the steps for this, and I know a couple of, at least a couple of you have already started training in, in Salgan, um, but just to sort of reiterate what the steps are, you're gonna upload your data set to Runway. Um, they do have some very basic pre-processing tools. So if you just upload a bunch of images from Instagram and then you wanna like have Runway crop them all center, you can do that. And we'll, we'll, I'll show you a little bit of that work uh, in Runway. Um, I would say their pre-processing tools are pretty limited. So if you know how to use the command line and you remember the data sets tool library that Lee and I showed you, it's probably easier to do it there than it would be to like use it through Runway, um, for sure. Uh, third, you're gonna pick the transfer model and we were talking about transfer models uh, when we do the full demo, um, but basically you're gonna need to pick a transfer model to transfer from. Um, the one that they sort of default recommend to is a face model. And we'll talk about what that happens when you train off of the face model. Um, and this is a really important step is that you actually need to pick a transfer model, not by the content of the model they're offering to you, but actually by the resolution. Um, so we'll again talk about this when we get into the demo. Uh, you need to choose a training length. So I think Jason had asked me like, how long do these train for? Um, you can train it for as little as I think a thousand steps. You could train it as long as 10,000, probably do longer than 10,000. I've never seen anyone do more than 10,000, but you could if you wanted to. So just choose a training length, then you train it. Um, and then I recommend like checking on the model every hour just to make sure there are no failures or you know, errors. Um, but basically at, once you're training, you just sort of let it go and it, they send you an email when their training's done. Um, so then when it's done, like we'll talk about, uh, we'll, in the demo, we'll talk about how to like quickly make some really quick samples of your work. Uh, and then we'll talk about testing it probably more next week. So I'm just gonna quickly walk through, like we'll do a full demo after break, but I'm just gonna quickly walk you through sort of the step-by-step um, -step process and also to talk about some of these screens here. Um, so this is your sort of training interface when you choose StyleGAN. Um, everything in the middle column here are your data sets that are available to you. You'll see that I've uploaded a bunch of different data sets. They do have some default data sets already available. So if you wanna train off of some of theirs, um, we'll look at that in the demo. Um, but it's worth noting that a lot of those data sets are pretty noisy. So they also just scrape Instagram or they also just scrape Google images and they uploaded some stuff. And not every one of those data sets is like very clean. Um, and it's uh, a debate within the GAN community whether you need a super clean data set or not. But in my recommendation, it's like easier to, it's better to know that if something failed with a super clean data set that you know it's like on you or like you know the data set like maybe did something wrong that is to like train with an unknown data set and not be sure why your model failed or didn't. Um, so this is sort of the screen where you pick data sets. Um, this is a uh, screen of sort of how the pre-processing uh, tools work. Um, they're pretty limited. Uh, you basically in the left-hand column here have a bunch of images, all of your images that you've uploaded, and then you've got some sort of like default sort of uh, options to start cropping things. Um, I will say the random crop is good if you like just wanna sort of see what happens with things. Um, most people just choose the center crop. And the problem with the center crop is obviously like, I think we, Leah talked about this in, in a previous class, but like if your head is at the top of the screen and it's a long image and you crop the center, you might get like, you know, my beard. Um, so let's just sort of think about like what you're doing. 
you can go through every one of these images individually and choose an option. Um, with a thousand images, that is going to be a lot of work. Uh, you could do it. Again, I would probably recommend that you actually use one of my data set tool libraries to like do it all batched on all of your images at once rather than go through them individually. But you have the option. Uh, this is where you'll want to change. Oh, uh, what pick does your... auto crop do? Auto crop actually uses a machine learning okay. model to try to guess what the crop should be. Um, Has it? Have you noticed if it's decent? Uh, it's so so. That's basically okay. what I would describe. Um, I should also mention the auto crop will will do crops that are rectangular, and then when you actually need to convert it to a square crop, it'll still convert it to a square crop. So it's also like not the most like user friendly tool either. Um, so in general, I would say like play with it and see what happens, but it might not be the best solution. Uh, once you have your data set like sort of processed and ready to go, you will need to do some training options. Um, we'll talk about this in the demo, but you could choose StyleGAN 1 or StyleGAN 2. My recommendation is to choose StyleGAN 2 if you want something that looks fairly realistic. Um, StyleGAN 1 is good on faces and not much else. Um, StyleGAN 2 is much better on pretty much anything else. Um, if for whatever reason you don't want to do StyleGAN 2, StyleGAN 1 will train a little bit faster, um, but it will generally be a lot murkier and a lot like noisier. Um, so it's up to you, um, sort of a balance of what you're looking for and a balance of how much you want to spend. Um, and then this section here, we'll, we'll dive into a little bit more during uh, the demo, but basically this is where you pick a pre-trained model. Um, and again, they recommend the Flickr Faces HQ um, as your default. Um, actually, I think they call it Faces when you're in StyleGAN 2, but it's the same data set. This is a 1024 by 1024 model. And again, we'll talk about like why you actually need to pick your pre-train based on size and not on content. Um, over here on the left is, or over here on the right is the training steps. Um, I think, yeah, so here's some other options. So there's, this is in StyleGAN 2, there's a cars model, there's a cats model, there's a churches model. Most of these are pretty small. Uh, like the cats, churches, and horses are all 256 by 256. Again, I will, I will reiterate this until I'm blue in the face. Uh, pick your model by resolution, not by content. Um, when you are choosing steps, there is over here, there's an option to click on estimated cost. Um, just sort of see how much you're going to spend. Uh, the price for this, so the price for doing inference or testing within the runway interface is five cents a minute. For training, it's half a cent per step. Um, and that's, that's sort of a fixed rate. It's like, if it takes longer for it to train, it's not going to charge you any more. Um, in fact, I personally have found that they under char or like they underestimate how long it's actually going to take. In most instances, when it said five hours, it's taken seven, um, or like if it says three hours, it takes five. Like they underestimate the time that it, that it takes to, to do that, uh, which is great. Like you maybe are actually like saving yourself some money because it is more about steps than it is about, uh, how long it takes. So it is worth to like, one thing I should note is that if you have like, if you have $10 in your account and you start a training at $15, um, when you run out of money, they will shut off your machine. So this is very, if you're like low on, on count, make sure you check to see how much money you're going to need because uh, they will shut off your machine when you hit your, your rate limit. Uh, they won't like give you extra credits and then like make you pay for it later. They'll just shut off your machine. So make sure you have enough money to do your training. Um, that is very important. If your One machine other thing shuts, I, yeah. sorry, I have a question. Uh, if your yeah, machine shuts off halfway, can you pick up your training from where it got dropped or do you have to start from the beginning again? I don't recall. I mean, I, I would hope that they could just pick up from where you start off. I would just say like, just don't let it happen. That's probably the safer bet. Um, yeah, so double check that you always have enough money to actually do your training. Um, the other thing note is that if you guys have already trained a model, uh, you get one free model training uh, using just when you install Runway. If you uh, have already used that one and you want to do training again, you need to buy one of their plans. And their plans are, I believe, $15 a month. Um, and you can cancel those anytime. So if you're like just going to do a training for this class, you like pay $15 for the month um, and then cancel it. Make sure you remember to cancel it. Um, that is just to get access to training. On top of that, you will still have to pay this rate. Um, so it's not just like a free for all, cool, I'm playing a plan, I don't have to ever pay again. Um, that is just to get access to this. So make sure you're aware of that as well. So when your training is in progress, um, you will see in the center here, we'll look at this a little bit more. You will see what we are, what um, Lee and I will refer to as fakes. These are basically uh, samples of what your training looks like at the moment. 
So see, this is very, very early in my process. And uh, I have a bunch of faces here. So like these are just, um, we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about transfer model, transfer learning. Um, but you will start with faces and you might be kind of shocked by that. That is okay, that is normal. Um, that's what happens when you, when you start with one of these models. It will quickly like move to whatever your data set is. Uh, along the right hand side here, it'll tell you sort of how much steps you're using, uh, the approximate time you want to use. If you want to stop your model, uh, one thing to know is if you stop your model, I think it's basically broken. Like I don't know that you can actually like get those files back um, and you will lose whatever money that you've already spent. Um, so I would recommend not stopping your model unless you like really, really have to, or you realize you screwed up. Um, so I don't think you can get back to those files uh, again, or like you might be able to, but then it's like, it's in a weird broken process. So just be, be careful with that. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the FID score. Um, everyone asks me about FID score. Um, everyone says, why isn't my FID score going down? Why isn't it this number instead of this number? Um, and my, okay, I didn't talk about it here. Basically, your FID score does not matter. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but like, don't worry about it. Is basically, basically what I want people to know. So transfer learning. Um, let's talk about this while I have this screen up. So again, we're talking about um, basically what you do is you pick up from the original, like from the original model. So this is an example of a, a training I just did recently. So when it starts, it starts with those faces and those faces quickly disappear. The reason that we or like Runway does transfer learning is it saves you a ton of time. If you were to do what we call training from scratch, which would be to like start a model from nothing and then train on it, it takes about two or three times as long. Um, so realistically within Runway, it would cost you like triple the amount of money. Uh, you don't want to do that, believe me. Um, I know that they've talked about adding that in, but I would recommend like it's not worth worrying about. Um, all that will happen is you will have, one second, um, all that will happen in your model is in the early stages, you will have these very like weird sort of faces and then um, they will quickly disappear. Um, so like, don't worry if in the first thousand steps you see faces, they'll be like obliterated very quickly. Demir, I think you had a question. Yeah, I was just gonna ask about whether or not it changes the accuracy if you tr if you were to train it from scratch. No, right? It's sort of. The um, same thing. I mean, I've I've trained probably hundreds of models now. I don't know. Um, I I probably am one of the people that has trained the most models, like outside of people who actually made StyleGAN. And I would say I've seen very little, like, cap I've seen very little information that says to me that they train worse if you use if you use transfer learning. Um, cool. Yeah, so in general, it's like, it works, it's fine. Um, lots of people say, well, if I'm not, if I'm not making a data set, it's faces, why would I train off faces? And the truth is that like within a thousand steps, all of that data is gone. But the reason that transfer learning is really interesting is that what we think sort of happens or like what people theorize is happening here is that when you train off a model that's already been trained fully, it learns a lot more behind the scenes than you see when they're just producing images. So I always make this analogy that if I were to ask someone to write me a sentence in English, uh, the amount of information you need to learn to be able to write a sentence in English is far exceeds that one sentence, right? And that's sort of what we think is going on here is that these, these models are learning to make images and they just happen to be like focusing on making faces, but they learn a lot of other stuff about how to make images behind the scenes. So when you pick up from that, you're picking up like a lot of already learned knowledge and you're able to just sort of like quickly iterate toward what you want. It's pretty cool and people are like still like, like no one is actually sure how this works, but like they just know it does. Um, it's like kind of fascinating that it's like still an unknown science, um, but this will save you a lot of money and time. So enjoy it. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, FID scores, that is this number here. Um, an FID score is how data scientists understand if, if their images are produced are like good or not. And what they care about is they care about realism, right? So they have a score that is how realistic is this face compared to real human faces? <clears throat> and behind the scenes, what they're using is they're using a, a, a classifier model that is only trained on like faces and animals and like photographic objects. So in most cases, your FID scores will be very high because what you're producing is not that. You're not producing a face, you're not producing a cat, you're not producing a dog, you're not producing a water bottle, like those sort of things. So. A lot of people like see like, so basically if you read papers, you will find that the current state of the art FID score is about four. Um, so people will train their models and be like, why isn't my FID score a four? And it's like, well, 
it's because you're training it on something abstract and not on a real animal. Like it just doesn't work like that. So FID scores do not matter like in terms of like absolutes. They are sort of helpful in terms of reference and we'll go over that um, in the demo, but essentially like there is, uh, you can see if your FID score is lowering or and at what pace um, and it might help with some things like learning if your thing is failing or not. We'll talk about that more as, as I go through the, the demo. Um, okay, so really quickly before we jump off for break, um, I wanna have Leah talk about things to watch out for. Yep. So there are two main things you need to watch out for when you're training your own model. Um, the first one is overfitting. Um, and what this will look like is um, you'll train your model and then you might look at your generated images and some of them might look exactly like some images from your training data set. Um, so what overfitting is, is when your model essentially memorizes particular images from your training set and doesn't learn how to generalize from it. Like if your generator is just memorizing specific images um, and it's getting by the discriminator, then it's not really learning about um, like what do cats in general look like? Um, rather than being like, okay, I'm gonna just feed the discriminator cat one and cat three and get by that way. Um, so this is an example of some images that I produced, uh, and this is an example of overfitting. Uh, and we'll talk about why this happens in a minute. But one really easy way to sort of see that this is an overfitting model is if I look at like, say this laptop here and this laptop here, they look almost exactly the same. And in a set of this many fakes, um, you shouldn't see this many similar images. Um, there should be, if this were a good generalized model, many of these images look pretty different from each other. Um, and I'd also see moments in between images. And, it, and like, so I, I call out these two images as things that are matching, but you also see like this laptop screen shows up here, 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 here. Like in this, like there's probably like 400 images in the screen. Like I would say like five to 10% of them are pretty much the exact same image. And that's a good sign that you're overfitting. Um, another good sign of telling if something is overfitting is when you make an animation of it, if it doesn't smoothly animate, and it just bounces around, that's a sign that you've overfit, right? So here on the right, like you can see there's like perfect sort of like fluid interpolation between these images. Um, here there is not, it just bounces. Um, this is an example of like pretty clear overfitting. Um, and the reason that happened is, uh, well, okay, so it's not like, so okay, so this is a, this is a bad thing, um, but if you like the look of how these things look kind of glitchy and stuff, it's fine. Um, the truth is it's pretty, you get pretty limited return on these, right? So like, let's say I spent 30, $40 to make this model and it overfit. Um, I now get maybe a hundred images that are like cool and glitchy, but like, that's it. Like, I don't really get a huge return for my money. So it's worth like thinking about like, if you like, if you want it, you could force to overfit your models, but it would be like kind of a, a waste of money. Uh, so it isn't, it's terrible for art, but it's like not great. Um, and so some causes of why this might be happening are mostly data set problems. Um, usually it's because your data set is either too small or not diverse enough or it contains a lot of duplicates. So basically like you might have a data set that's really small and have a lot of similar images in it. Um, and what that means to the generator is that it might overlearn specific parts of your training data set because like each image is weighted a lot higher. And so like what you can do about this is basically uh, play with your data set and add more images to it, add more diverse images. Um, you might want to augment your data set by mirroring images. Yeah, and so this is why I recommend that you get more images than you probably think is humanly possible. Um, you know, I've seen models work at 300, 400 images, but it's like you're really risking overfitting. And uh, in my experience, if people have a bad at first training experience, they never want to do it again. So I want to make sure that you guys have like a good experience for your first time because um, if things overfit or if you get load collapse, which we'll talk about next, it can be like kind of defeating. Um, so I try to like push people to make sure they can find as many images as they can. So mode okay. collapse. Yeah, mode collapse is the second thing you need to watch out for. Um, what this might look like is you might train a model on a data set containing um, a couple of different types of things. Like you might put in a data set of uh, both images of cats and images of dogs. 
and then your model might only learn to generate dogs. And so what mode collapse is, is when the generator finds a couple of solutions that fool the discriminator, but it doesn't learn all the solutions that could work. It only finds a couple and gets by that way. So a kind of high level illustration of what mode collapse is, is um, the thing on the left, um, the red dots might be your data set. Um, your data set might be like, have eight different like clumps in it, like maybe cats and dogs and horses and whatnot. Um, and your generator, in the case of mode clap, is only generating one of them. And the reason why this um, can still exist within the realm of the GAN is because it's just the discriminator's job, like the bank's job, to tell whether it's a forgery, like whether it's real or fake. But it doesn't really care at all, or there's nothing at all in the GAN setup to encourage the generator to cover all the possibilities. And so what actually happens in StyleGAN um, that I find is you get these crazy noisy images. This is a sign of, no, of mode collapse um, where it doesn't even look like the data set, right? So like if it looked like the data set, you could almost say, well, it's, that's overfitting. But these don't even look like the data set. They just look like noise. Um, and this will happen to you. I promise if you do like, if you do 10 trainings, this will happen to you at least one of those times. Um, so don't be worried if you like, if this happens to you, unfortunately you do lose your money. Like there's no, but there's nothing runway could do. There's nothing I could do to fix this. What actually ends up happening is you just retrain and it works. Um, it is sort of like a randomness inside of the uh, GAN model that can happen. Um, so again, like if this happens, you do get kind of cool results. Like here's an example of a mode collapse that I experienced and it's kind of cool. But again, it's like my return on like investment is pretty low. Um, like I got to post this to YouTube and people said it was cool and how did I do it? And it's like, I fucked up, that's how I did it. Um, so, you know, it's like, uh, there's maybe like 30 different images in this model that I could actually produce, um, which is pretty low considering I trained it on like a bunch of images. Um, I expect to get more back from that than just this. So, so quick question. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so you said that you just retrained it. So just due to the randomness of it, by like not touching anything, you just ask it to run again, it might not have mode collapse. Yep, uh, it might not have mode collapse. So this is again a case of where, because we don't have as much control in runway, we, there are things that I would personally do in my model behind the scenes if I had more control over it that would potentially reduce mode collapse. Um, that means lowering the learning rate, but you can't do any of that inside a runway. So you sort of have to be like, okay, I'm just gonna retrain it. Um, most times it'll be fine. Uh, I've actually like, I've also heard of things hitting mode collapse and then at, like you might hit a mode collapse like 2000 steps in and then 3000 steps in, it's actually like gone. Um, it's again, there's a lot of little randomness in there that happens. Um, it's because there's all these like little micro parameters, very, very tiny float numbers that could mean the model gets stuck in a spot or it gets out of a spot. And there's things around um, if you're really interested, you could look up something called adversarial networks or adversarial images. Um, and basically, there, there are discriminator-like models where you could fake the discriminator by like sh just sending it a perfectly set of noise that for whatever reason tricks it. Um, yeah, this is like kind of one of the bummers. Um, but again, it does happen to everyone. I don't want anyone to think that they somehow failed and they made a mistake. This just happens because of GANs. Okay, so before we go to break, I've got two, two more slides to show. Um, which is a thing I also hear commonly from people, which is that when they are done training, uh, they look at their model and they do something like this. They say, okay, I've trained this for 3000 images. Um, I really like 2260 and I really like 2570. <laughs> and I'll sort of be like, well, why? And they'll point it and they'll look at this one image and they'll say, I like the orange in this image. That means this is a good model. Um, and normally I would say like, yes, you are right. Like, this is a good image. If you like this image, you like this image, but that does not mean the model is good, or that does not mean that, that this is the model you should always generate from. Um, my usual recommendation is that you should not look at steps like that are 100 apart. Like this is too close. Um, for one, because you can't actually access like your, your models on a 100, 100 step basis, they're all on 500. But even if you could, even if you were training on them on like a paper space server, like I do, these are, there's such random small differences between this step and this step that yes, might change a certain image in a certain way, but that doesn't mean the rest of the model is changed in that same way. Um, 
remember that you're seeing here, what, like maybe 20 images. These are 20 samples out of potentially thousands upon thousands within your model. Um, so in general, don't think that just because you like a couple images of a sample that the overall model is better than another one. So don't do this. Don't look at these super close. I describe this as watching the, the, the pot boil. Like you're just waiting for it to boil over and like you're just wait, you feel like you're waiting forever. Uh, it is not like helpful. It will drive you insane to try and pick between these tiny little steps. <clears throat> what I do recommend, however, is looking at like every thousand steps, every 500 steps and deciding between those. And you'll see here, like there are big jumps and changes between these four steps, right? Um, you know, this one is very like pretty chaotic. This one is a lot more geometric. Um, but you all see there are like much more color changes here compared to this one. Um, this is probably the way that I would recommend at least start that you start checking out your model and deciding what iteration you're going to build from. Um, Cause again, I have a much better sense of how this model is going to look different from this model. Now there are ways to like actually like work within each of your 500 step data to test things and see what happens. Um, but I would start with the samples and just sort of go from there. Um, but again, like, these are just samples. So like, it's really important to like not get stuck on what you're seeing here and think more about what the bigger uh, model is. Um, and we'll talk about some techniques to like sort of see a bigger uh, group of your model data to sort of understand how it works. Okay, so uh, we're running a little late, but I think we'll be fine. Um, so why don't we come back at 38 after the hour? Um, everyone take a break, I need to grab some water um, and we'll be back in a minute to do a full demo, cool? All right, see everybody in five minutes. I'll resume my recording. Um, okay, so we're gonna do a full on demo inside of Runway uh, now. So hopefully I'll just walk people through some steps. If you have questions, please feel free to stop me um, and uh, we'll just have at it. So, cool. Um, also, uh, we were gonna talk about projects after the break, we're running a little behind. So. Um, since I know some people have kids and they want to uh, log out for the night, um, maybe we can do like a Q&A or whatever after class to, to, talk, to talk about um, projects or other things. Then. So, all right. So when you open Runway for the very first time, let's close this out. Um, I assume everyone knows this, but just in case. Here's my load screen. There it is. So um, you could in any of these, pick any of these options, uh, but also if you could just start right from training a model. And again, on the left hand uh, rail here, you've got the training is option three. So we're obviously gonna pick the generative image model um, and we're gonna train a model. So let's go ahead and click this. Um, you should give your name a model uh, or your, give your model a name. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna actually name this, I'm gonna name this Free F3. Um, I trained something like this yesterday, uh, so I can just quickly show you sort of what happens after it's produced, because obviously it's going to take a couple hours. This is a data set trained on images from an artist by the name of Freya Buckler. Um, she has like a pretty big Instagram following. She had a lot of like nice geometric images, so that would be fun to train off that. Um, so you'll see I already have these data sets here. Uh, the way this works is if you don't already have your data set here, you should press upload, um, and then you'll want to select your data set. This is running really slow for me right now. Let me click some things, see if I got like a data problem here. Let's close out Slack. Let's close out Figma. Let's close out Spotify. All right, let's see if this goes a little faster now. Come on. All right, let's just restart this. Live demos never work right. Um, while I'm restarting this, uh, Demir, I know you said you had a problem getting these up to runway. So I do recommend that you use JPEGs when you upload everything. Um, it's very yeah, hard to get. I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing like a Photoshop batch thing to yep. their BMP files, I realized. Oh, okay. That's yeah. What, that's that might what be part the of the issue too. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, okay. Um, let's try this again. What am I doing with, oh, I got enough, I got enough gigabytes. Should be fine. There we go, that felt faster. Um, they do sort of, Runway does do like a back uh, behind the scenes sort of updates. 
that sometimes I feel like does slow down the machine a little bit. Um, so we're gonna go in here, we're gonna choose a new one. Um, let's just make this free of four. Um, so if you wanna upload your data set, you click the plus button, um, it'll pull up a uh, menu here. I would just pick this one, which is already like sort of set up for me. Um, basically what I did with this, I just ins I scraped her Instagram. Um, I'm not gonna release this publicly because obviously that'd be pretty messed up. Um, but I scraped her Instagram. I cleaned up a lot of the images or just like dropped a bunch of like photographs she had of herself or like gallery shows. So it's mostly just her work. Um, so you click open. This is going to uh, upload your data set um, and then he's process it. So I'm probably gonna skip this just because I already have it here. And someone is uploading depending on how big it is and depending on your internet can be pretty slow. Um, this might take a couple minutes before, before it gets ready. I already have a model over here. Um, I'm gonna select this one. Uh, you will see on the right hand, when you pick this option, you have the option to pre-process. So I'm gonna look, go through this and just sort of show you um, some of the details here. Um, there are, again, ways to crop every individual image in a different way. Um, this is sort of a like pretty straightforward, just like GUI tool of just like being able to grab stuff and drag corners around. Um, so in this case, this image is 640 by 640. So I could just say I want this crop or whatever. Maybe I don't want any of that background and I could crop it. And I could do this for every single image. That will take you quite a while, um, but you could do it. Another option is here is you can click the, the checkbox here, select all of these, and then select center crop. Um, and that's just gonna center crop all of them. Um, mo my guess is that most of these images are already center cropped. Um, I grabbed them from Instagram, so a lot of them are already squares. Um, but you could just sort of go in and do any, do any of these, any number of these from here. Um, I'm just gonna close this. I already have a data set that I wanna work off of, but there are options in here if you wanna play with them. Um, you could play with the auto crop. Uh, you can delete features out of here. So like if there's an image in here that maybe you missed previously and you wanna delete it, like you could just grab one of these images and just remove it. Um, and that'll remove a bunch of those images. Um, so I'm gonna work off this one. When you finish pre-processing a data set, uh, it adds a little name here. It'll say like whatever the name of your data set is plus transformed. So see, this is still uploading, it's pretty slow. Um, so I'm gonna grab this data set. It's already pre-processed. Um, you don't need to do any pre-processing if you don't want to. Runaway will just go in and crop all your images center crop and scale them up to whatever resolution they need to be. Um, so you, if you don't wanna like deal with doing it all by hand, you can do it that way. Just know you'll have a little less control and might not know exactly what's going on. Um, yeah. So once you have finished up your data set, you are now at your training options. So you've got two options here. You can choose style again, or you can choose style again too. Uh, again, my default recommendation will be to choose style again too. Um, just you get better photorealistic images, um, but it does take a little bit longer to train, although I don't think it's that much longer. And also, uh, like they don't charge by how long it takes to train, they charge by how many steps it is. Um, so even style again too, I would maybe recommend doing another thousand extra steps just to be sure. Um, but in general, it's like, just choose style again too if you're not sure. Um, Here's where you pick pre-trained models. Uh, so again, this is where we pick transfer learning from. Um, they always default to faces, which is a 1024 by 1024 model. You can change that. Um, so let's say you have a 256 by 256 model. You can change your models here. So you'll see down here, um, the important thing to read is actually this very tiny little type. Um, so faces is 1024 by 1024. Cars is 512 by 384. So if you have a landscape model, you can actually train a landscape model, I forget that. You can train, train a landscape model, but it has to be that exact size. Um, and the other ones are all 256. Now there's also, because I've already done some training, um, you can pick up off of an old model. So if you found you didn't train something for long enough, you could train it again. So let's say I didn't think I would train the first version of this model, which trained for 6,000 steps and train it long enough. I could select this. And then when I come over here, um, I will have training steps. So um, again, if you're starting from scratch, I probably would recommend about 5,000 steps. Um, that's generally where I would start. I think that's like a good number. Um, I personally find 3,000 is too low and I find 5,000 is just about right because sometimes I wanna go down. In my experience, it's always good to overtrain and then go backwards if you don't like where it ended up um, than it is to undertrain. In my experience, retraining on StyleGAN introduces some weird behaviors that I haven't really been able to diagnose. So in general, like it's not, it's not the end of the world if you decide to retrain on top of your other model or like continue training. Um, but I have noticed some weird behaviors where like for the first thousand of that new training, it isn't really learning it the same way. Um, so I would just recommend that maybe uh, try to just overshoot this for your first time and just sort of see where it goes. Um, so again, if you, uh, let's say, let's set this to 5,000. 
Um, if you click on estimate cost, it will tell you how much it's going to cost. It'll also tell you what your current balance is. So again, I just would recommend like, if you're new to training on this thing, just double check to make sure you have enough money. Um, Cause again, you don't want to shutting down early on you. That just is, leads to more messes than you want. So um, I'm actually just gonna, I'm gonna switch my model here. I'm gonna continue training on this, continue to continue training um, for another 5,000 steps just cause I already trained this. So I just want to see what it does. Um, so at this point we're gonna click start training. Um, you should pretty much be ready to go. I had a question about the, um, yeah. about the resolution. You said to pick yeah. um, a model based on the resolution you want, but I noticed that like the file, the, the example file that you had was like at 680 and this is at 1024. Yeah. Does that matter? Or? Uh, it matters only in that what they're going to do is they're going to res up that image. So it will be fuzzy. Um, so they will okay. scale it up. So in you general, pick it on yeah. the, the output size you want rather yes. than what you're feeding it. Ideally you're feeding it the same, but it doesn't have to be the same. Yeah, exactly. If this were a model that I were really like excited about doing the right way and not just like a demo model, I would have made sure that I scraped only 1024 images of this artist's work. Um, because it's a demo, I don't mind if it gets scaled up. Actually, there's probably some like benefit to scaling this up because it introduces some fuzziness, which then like makes it more mine and less hers. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, in general, I would say like you want your data to be as good as possible going in, um, but know that like Runway has like you can do some like very quick, hacky, sort of sketchy stuff if you want. So I'm click start training. Um, this will just kick off the training process. It usually takes a couple of minutes before this really kicks off. Um, basically behind the scenes, they're spinning up a server. They're installing all the software they need. Um, they're loading your data set in. They're doing a bunch of work that you, that if you've ever been a part of my style again classes, like Moises has or Fabiola has, you know, like there's a lot of work you have to do before you can actually start training. So they're doing that work behind the scenes for us, which is great. We don't have to deal with it. Um, so this will be training. While this trains, I'm going to go through basically what happens when the, when a model is done. Um, and then we'll come back and look at this a little bit and sort of keep an eye on this uh, as it goes. So I'm going to click in here to, to the first version of this model that I made. When this is done, it'll say like sort of yay, hooray, you're done. Um, there's two options here. You can view your model or you can add it to your workspace. Um, it also produces like a fun little video for you. Um, so one thing, one thing I like about, I would actually recommend that you download this video. They've actually made these videos a lot better. They used to be like five seconds. Now they're like 30 seconds. So if you like save this video, um, like let's just click it and save it. Um, so let's just give us a name here. So we're going to name it um, like a uh, sample video. I can spell today. Um, this is going to get added to your exports. Now this is what I like about this is this will help you know if you've overfit. Um, it'll help you know sort of a little bit more about what the expanse of the model is, right? So we've only looked at samples so far. Um, this will help you know a little bit more about your model, like how it interpolates and other things. So while this is generating, um, this actually, does this, oh, it doesn't actually put it here. It must've just like saved it directly to my file. Maybe because I've already saved it. That might be why. Um, let's just see here. Yeah, so sample video. Oh, it looks like it's downloading. Um, where did that go? There we go. So this is downloading. It looks like it's downloading pretty slowly. Probably because I'm also uploading that other data set at the same time. When this is done, we can look at it and sort of see, but actually I already have one here, um, which is, oops, it was there. Um, it's this one. So what's nice about this is you can sort of see that like clearly I have an overfit, right? It's like still finding all these interpolations between things, but I also get a good sense of just like what the, what the interpolation space looks like. So it's pretty abstract. Like I like the color settings. There's some geometric stuff, um, but nothing too crazy. So this is just helpful for me to see. I recommend downloading and saving these just so you can look at them. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna actually look at that model. Um, so let's actually go over here and let's click on view my model. Oh, that's actually not the thing I wanna do. Uh, we wanna go over here. Yeah, go for it. Video. So yeah. is there a way to make a video like that in Runway, like you, using your model? We will look at that next week. There is a way to do it, but you have to do it through P5.js. Um, but I'll show you how to do it. And like, basically once you have the code, which I'll share with everyone, you can, you can just randomly do it yourself and it works pretty much the same way. And I'll talk a little bit about more how to like manage and control those things next week. But yes, you can kind of. Um, so actually the way that, what I want to do is I actually want to look at my training. So up here at the top is the review, which is like, here's the video, whatever. Um, I want to go to training. This is a, so this is basically my training steps. 
um, you can scroll along this thing, uh, the slider, and it's usually pretty slow initially, but it does sort of pick up and it will show you all of these images you've been producing. So again, it's helpful for me to see it here. It's also helpful for me to see that video, just sort of understand what does the final output look like. But maybe I do want to go back a little bit further and I want to say like, okay, looking around step 4,000, like I really like, I like the images that are being produced, right? They're not as geometric. I see a little bit more diversity in sort of their outputs. Um, they're a little bit fuzzier, interesting kind of things. So, um, but I also want to compare it to like, let's say 5,000. You don't have to get like too exact, but it's like very like micro changes between these steps, right? So, okay, so this one looks pretty good too. If you go back to like 1,000 steps, I bet you'll see like some, this is pretty chaotic. This is pretty common for the 1,000 step that's trained off of faces. There's still a lot of little details and things that you've learned from sort of that model um, that are still being trained away. Um, what's also cool is you can produce, if you, create, if you create a progress video, clicking this button, it produces a little video for you that looks like um, it looks like this. Um, so this sort of shows you just how it trains. These are fun to share on like Instagram or like on Twitter because your friends will ask you like, how the hell did you do this? Um, so you get to sort of see the faces erase over time, right? Very quickly they erase at about step 1000 or so. Um, but if you actually go back and look, you can kind of still see them in there. But at this point, they're like completely gone now, right? Um, so this is like, just a really helpful thing to sort of see how it trained, whether like there are any weird bumps or any like weird glitches, um, but that's available to you as well. Um, okay, so uh, you could, you'll see also on the side here that it does give you an FID score. Um, when you start these, um, the FID score is pretty high. It's at 300. Um, where did it end up? It ended up at 170. I honestly wouldn't expect it to go much lower than that just because this is abstract stuff and it's not like cats or dogs or humans. Um, so don't be too shocked if your FID score on abstract stuff stays pretty high. Um, the truth is, if you want a really, really low FID score, if you want to train it on real photographs of animals or faces, and you want to train it for a really, really long time, um, in which case it's going to be very expensive. So again, it's like, is it worth it? I don't know. Is it worth it to have like a cat that looks like a real cat when you have thousands of cat photos on the internet? Maybe for you it is, but like I would personally say it's not really that important to me. So FID scores are helpful. You might actually see a place where um, in some models, it'll go down to like 180 and then it might go back up to 220. And that might be indicative that, that at 180, it actually trained really well. Or just that at 180, it looked, like a, it looked more like an animal than it did like your art. So even if it drops, that might be a, an indication to look at that space and be like, do I like these better? But I wouldn't like say that that means that that is absolutely the best place to be, that is the, what you need to be building from in the future. FID score is like, I, I kind of hate that Runway put it in here because it is like, it makes people kind of go crazy. Like they obsess over the numbers. I would say that as an artist, like you should care about what the images are and nothing else. So like, it doesn't matter what the FID score is. If, if you're happier with the samples and happier with the model, that's all that matters. Um, okay, so when this is done, so you've got some steps here, like you can go back and look at the training data by going here. You can go to review and this will again um, set up your, this sort of gives you the final output. Let's say that I did want to train off of uh, step 4,000 from here on. Uh, the, right now this is stuck at step 6,000, right? Cause that's how far I trained it. If I want to go back to step 4,000, you click this little change button. Um, and sometimes on certain screens, like it will, you won't see this thing here below. Um, but if you scroll down, you will see that all of your steps based on 500 increments are available to you. <clears throat> now, there's two things you might want to know. Um, the first is that there is you 14 days to complete, to like decide which one of these is your default, right? So I might want to say that like, if I were going to make this public, I might want to um, save as default. And um, from there, I would, this is what I would want to make public to, to other folks. Now, let's say that I actually like, don't really want to make this the default, but I do want to just sort of keep the other versions. Like, let's say for every reason, I like the really weird 1000 version. If you right click here and you click download, this will download your pickle file for that number. Um, and you'll see here that you can name it. Um, it has free GAN. I would recommend that you number all of your models. So if you're gonna download multiple files, do free GAN 1000 steps. It's like, you will end up with like 30 free GAN models on your desktop and you won't know which ones are which. And it's very hard to tell after you're done. So make sure you label them as you're going. Um, if I just save this, it's gonna save it. It's like. These files are um, hundreds of megabytes 
big, so they will like take a while for you to like download them. Um, so I'm gonna have a bunch of files downloading to my desktop as we go through this. But this is available to you. Just remember that I believe after 14 days, they will only show you your default. You might be able to download them, but I'm fairly sure that, that what they're doing is they're actually trying not to have that many files on their servers. Um, so after 14 days, you will lose these. So maybe the first thing you should do is just download them. Um, what you can do, and I think this is what we talked about earlier, is like you can continue training, but only off of your default. So for whatever reason, you mode collapse at step 6,000, and you really want to retrain off of step 4,000 where it wasn't mode collapsing, make sure you set that as your default so that then you can continue training off of that step later. I'm going to set my uh, step back to uh, 6,000 as my default. And I believe if I come all the way down here at the, nope, okay. So if you just click, I think if you just click change, it'll maybe not hide. I guess there's no way to hide this. Anyway, um, let's actually just say, like, let's, we can also edit these names. Um, so you can set this to um, free GAN uh, four or 6,000 steps. And this way, when you open it in your uh, testing model, you can actually see the names here. So um, let's just hit save. And so now I've got this model. Um, there's a couple things I could do here. Uh, the first is I could add it to my workspace and then I could just go through any of those vector inputs and start downloading samples from it. There is one cool feature here that I don't know how many people know about, which is the generate samples. Um, this will generate a hundred random samples from your image. So if you come over here, you can set this to whatever number you want. You could set this to 500. Um, you could set it to 50. Um, you can set it to whatever number you want. Now, no, when you run this, if you hit generate, this is going to charge you that five cents a minute uh, for a model that you're generating images from. So this, if this takes 10 minutes, it's gonna cost you 50 cents. So do be aware that like, this isn't just a free thing they're giving you, this will cost money to generate. Um, so if I'm just gonna come over here, I'm gonna set this really low, I'm just gonna set it to 20 just so we can sort of see. I guess it has to be 50, okay, that's fine. Um, and I'm just gonna generate. So where does this go? This goes into your exports, which is this fourth tab here. If you click in here, you will see that it's generating 50 images for me. Um, so when this is done, I'll be able to download those, those images. Um, so I'm just gonna let that run for a little bit and maybe we'll come back and check on this afterward. So again, what I would probably recommend is that you generate your images maybe at a couple different batches from a couple different steps. <clears throat> so what you might do is you might come in and download, like generate all of these 600 images, but then you might, when this is done, go back and move to step 400 or step 4,000 and generate another 50 examples from that. Like this is basically, you have to do this in like the, the span of two weeks. So maybe as soon as this model is done training, do it. Because you might wanna explore just like how different are the, are the model images outside the samples. Um, it's just helpful to sort of understand what you're looking at. Um, so it's good to like just sort of generate some images and just sort of see. So this is one way of doing it. Um, the other way of doing it is actually just to go back here and you just go to add this model to your workspace. So let's just add this to one of my workspaces. Um, and you'll see over here, it says free again, 6,000 steps. Um, you cannot change this, which is good to know. Although it looks like you could, oh, this is helpful. So you could actually upload your 4,000 steps um, or my 1,000 steps. So you can, um, even though they aren't saving them by default, you can re-upload them and then you have a model you could play with where you could see actually a bunch of different steps. Um, that's pretty helpful. This will not work because uh, this is only half download or like, 5% downloaded. So I can't do this now, but you could upload each of your steps here. Um, and then basically that's a way for them to know, like they will still store it for you, um, but those other ones will be deleted because they don't want to uh, store them if they don't have to. So this is a helpful thing. You could upload some extra ones here and then have coherent steps to play with. Um, so let's just run this really quickly. If I run this remotely, um, this will look no different than any of the other things that we've played with, um, but you'll be able to see your model here. Okay, so Moises, um, go ahead and ask your question while we get this up. Hey, yeah, so I was really curious about the mixed modeling step at like around 500 where things kind of look like a face and kind of look like your data set. So in order to kind of hone in on that more, like I just saw what you were saying about creating uh, your test images. So I guess you could create a thousand based on your 500 steps and then retrain. 
and then kind of keep zooming into that. Phase. So if you're really interested, yeah, if you're really interested in that weird phase of mixed modeling, uh, don't use runway. Um, so okay. there's other, so I, Moises, you know this, but like there's collab, there's other things available to you. Um, I don't really recommend using runway for, for stuff like mixed modeling because they have those very set increments of 500s. You can't really fine tune detail into those things. So if you really want to, um, I have a video on how to do some of this stuff through collab. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that, but just in general, I do not recommend trying that because it's just going to be messy. Um, it's really hard to like really narrow in your results inside a runway. Um, runway is really set up to train a new model, um, so just be aware of that. Okay, and the the collab notebook is to train style again too, or? Yes, it is a chain style again too, but obviously like this will also require you to create TF records, all the things that Runway hides from you, um, yeah. you'll have to do in collab. And I have a video on how to do that, but um, yeah, it is, a, it is definitely more work uh, than Runway for sure. Um, but you can do it. It's, I have some steps on how to do it, but it is definitely different. Um, so if you're really interested in that like zero to 500 step, um, look, I'll, I'll, I'll link the video to collab uh, in, our, in our video notes. Um, but yeah, you, you can't really do it in one way. It's just too hard. Um, it's, it's definitely set up to be different in a, inside of um, Collab. So this is generating some images so you can sort of start to see what we're producing here. Um, again, I won't spend too much time here because we've already talked about this, but there are your options of truncation. Um, so if you want to look at, we'll also look at this more next week, but if you want to look at truncation, other things, these are all now available to you inside of your model. So you can start to generate some images. I think my internet is being overloaded because I'm downloading, training, and uploading files all at once. So um, I have a sense that my internet is just like ready to, to quit for the day. Um, but this is pretty much it. This is the entire demo. Um, I do just like, let's go back really quickly and look at the model that's training right now. Um, this is created 24 minutes ago. So it should be a little bit into our training step. Training. No. Oh, 304 is the one in progress. Um, interesting. It looks like it maybe still is getting set up. OK. So oh, there we go. I get one step. I get one step. Um, so you'll see here that the FID score started at 160. So again, the hope is that because I'm continuing off of that other model, it will train a little bit better. Um, but again, it's all, it's all based on your eye and sort of what you want to see and what, what you're going to get out of it. So, um, I'll let this run for a little bit. I will share some of the results of this later this week. But um, yeah, that's pretty much the process. So uh, at this point, class is over. Your homework is basically to finish your data set and train your model. So if you haven't gotten a chance to finish your data set, make sure you do that. Um, if you haven't gotten a chance to actually produce your data set, um, or sorry, to start training, do that as well. Um, Lee and I are here if you have questions during training or like if you want to get, if you want one of us to like zoom in with you while you start it. For your very first time, let us know. We're happy to do that. Um, but I hope this is pretty straightforward. Um, so at this point, class is over. If you need to take off, feel free. Um, we'll just spend like the next half hour like take, fielding questions and maybe um, hopefully this trains a little bit further uh, during that time we can look at it before we end up. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll see everybody next week, hopefully with some cool models to train. Um, next week, I'll show you how to do some stuff using P5.js. And I'll also show you how to make your model public if you're interested in sharing with other people. Um, all right, cool. Uh, if, uh, runway... yeah. Thanks a lot, Derek. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good night. See you next week. If a uh, runway crashes locally while you're training, you're still good, right? Because it's... Yes. And uh, if you want to test out like the auto crop versus the center crop, is there like a good way to compare the results of that or just have to like have an auto crop and then like just kind of you know, look through them on runway, they do the center crop and do the same thing. Yeah, pretty much that. Yeah, that's, that's a, it like, so they just added the pre-processing tools about a month ago. Um, so my guess is that they'll do some more iteration on it um, to make it a little bit easier, but it's definitely like kind of clunky and like not the easiest thing to use right now. So um, I guess one thing that I'm worried about in the data set that I'm trading is that some of the things look too similar. Like it's like the same thing, but at like different angles. Um, and I don't know, would that cause overfitting? 
even though they are different images? Um, yeah, it's a great question. So this is a model trained on, um, this is a model trained on uh, a video. And so video also has very similar frames. What I have found is that it generally doesn't overfit um, because you have enough data. What it does sort of do, especially in the case of video, is it basically reproduces the video itself. Um, it's not like an exact one for one replica, but it definitely like sort of learns like sections of like animation um, and then it like hops around. So I recorded a video, I think um, maybe a couple, maybe last week that I might've posted in our Slack channel or maybe I posted in another Slack. Maybe I posted in the Salgan2 Slack channel. But anyway, I have a video for this. Um, actually, let me see if I have it here. Um, this one. So uh, and I, don't, I don't think video plays super well over Zoom. But anyway, this basically shows you that like, it doesn't understand like the time it takes to animate things. It just sort of like runs through different sections. It's really interesting, um, but it might end up being the same for you. If you have things where it's photographed like front, left, right, like you will get sort of like, it'll learn to animate that. And sometimes it will animate it, sometimes it won't. It's kind of like this weird herky jerky pattern um, where like it sort of understands how things are supposed to move and change, but it doesn't know how to. Um, yeah, so like, I don't think you'll actually have a problem with overfitting. I just think it might actually learn as you go through latent spaces, it might actually animate that, ex that change. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and I guess in this case, let's say that you had more explosions. Yep. Would you always want them to be around the same size or would it be like, okay, it's okay to have like an explosion, like a lot smaller, but it's still like in essence that thing <coughs> you wanted? Yeah, that's a great question. So these models learn at the resolution you train them on. So there's no concept of like, the model doesn't understand that this is a tiny explosion, this is a big explosion. It understands like pixels. It like understands what an explosion looks like in the section it's in. So in that case, if I were to have like a little explosion and a big explosion, it might understand that those are two different explosions and it might like, it might interpolate between them together or it might like find a different moment to switch to it. It's, it's all very like, it's like you're training like a three-year-old. Like it's, it's like kind of understands, but just not enough to actually be able to like really put it all together um, is the best way to describe it. So there are lots of ways. And like, I just generally find that when I feed a data set into a model for the first time, I almost never get out of it what I expect to, but that's all like often a good thing. Um, and that's sort of the, the fun of this process is like you have little, little to no control over it, but sometimes it's great. And sometimes you get like really cool things you never expected. And sometimes you get stuff that you're sort of like, uh, okay, that's boring. But like, okay, what did I lose? Like a couple hours? Okay, fine. Um, yeah, so it's just, it's a little bit of a chaotic process. April, I think you had a question, yeah? Yeah, I was wondering just in terms of images you're feeding it, like how much variation do you feel like you can stretch it to the fact that, like, I don't want it to be incomprehensible, but like, obviously yeah. you don't want it to be too similar. What's, I guess, what are kind of the bounds that you've tried like pushing in terms of like the most different that was still not noisy or like not? Yeah, uh, not that's, a such a tough, that's like the hardest question in all of this work. Um, I actually want to share, I'm going to share, um, Esteban is a student who has taken this class or like, yeah, what, what was this class, the beginner class and is currently in my style gang class. He just tried a model where it like very clearly got way too, way too diverse. Um, let me see if I can find him here. Where is he? Um, so he is training something on uh, Wes Anderson, like Wes, photos from Wes Anderson movies. Oh, we were trying to debug some stuff. This got really crazy. Um, here we go. I think this is the image I want. Um, so this is what he was trying to train it on. And like, you can just tell, like, I can tell this is too diverse. Maybe he couldn't, but like, I can tell this is too diverse, right? You have faces, you have faces of different scales. You've got bodies, you've got architecture. You've got these, like, like everything is a still a beautiful image, but it's just too much in one model. Um, so like, this is clearly too far, um, but actually getting it to, to back to where you want it to be is a, is that's the hard question. Um, I would generally say that like, the best, like a thing that always works well is if you have the same images where you sort of onion skin them over each other and they're different, like different enough, like again, like think about like a bunch of photos of or portrait photos of people. Like if you were to overlay those over top of each other, they'd always be a little different, right? Color lighting, hairstyles, diff just different eye face, like eyes, makeup, whatever, glasses, no glasses. Like that's always gonna work well. Like, so a place where it's like sort of a happy medium like you can see like in the examples, like let me just show you what, what the examples of like the data set that I fed this thing 
just now were like, I don't think at all it's what I expected it for it to produce um, because I think it actually ended up. So one thing that you also find is like, this thing destroys geometry. Like these are supposed to be very geometric photos and it turns everything into like squiggly lines. Like there's no geometry in these things at all. Um, but like, I'm sort of surprised by what it produced, right? It didn't produce that many different, like these have a lot of different cells of different color and it kind of flattened a lot of that to be like just one or two sections of color. Um, so it simplified this a lot. So you never really know with these models and maybe I could train this for another 10,000 steps and it might get to something better than this or more like this, but I don't know. And it's just sort of like, it's like, <clears throat> again, for me personally, I don't train these things to reproduce the exact images that I see, right? I produce them to produce something new. In this case, I got something really new and very different from the artist's work, so I'm happy with that. Cause like, I also don't want to rip off this artist. Like I just like scrape their Instagram and I don't really want to reproduce that work. But for, some, but for your work, since it is personal, you might want to get closer to what you actually have produced. So it feels a little bit more like you. And that's just a tough question. Like I would almost say like for you, <clears throat> try to find like similar, like if you have similar architecture, similar landscapes, like you might get good results with sort of like just landscapes and, and architecture. Mm -hmm. And then try to have like a similar scale, like, you know, in terms of depth um, or distance from the viewpoint. Um, and then, you know, just run it and see what happens. And if you need to run it for longer, you run it for longer. And that's sort of the process with all this stuff. And like, I tell everyone in my classes, like, you know, there are maybe a hundred, 200 people out here using runway the way you guys are. Um, we literally just don't know enough about these models to know how, what the best thing is. So you all are my guinea pigs. And like, I'm learning from you as much as I am about like my own work. Um, so some of this is like, we'll learn things that I'll, I'll never have known if, without teaching this class. Cool, thanks. Yeah, uh, Jesse. Uh, yeah, so, um, so I, what I was thinking about exploring was taking something that actually might be too similar, which is video game art. So such as like, I went mm. and grabbed you know, levels of Mario um, and then I could walk either each column or you know pan the camera at various levels and create a lot of different samples with the idea that you could almost make a sort of latent level you explore have like one player moving through latent space while the other player has to play the world or something like that ah somebody's done it no 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 oh. but i want to show i want to show um what it, this is a student who was in my class in january so one thing i recommend like so again if you think about that onion skinning thing one thing that works really, really well is if there's one thing that's static in an image and everything else around it changes, you get this really cool effect, which is this. Um, I'll share this link in, in our video in our Slack channel as well. But you get this thing of like, the bird stays pretty static, right? But the, the space around the bird does really crazy stuff. So in the case of a game, especially a 2D game, where like, if you could get it so that Mario's always in like a very similar position, you'll get this cool thing where Mario will stay static and everything around it will go kind of crazy. Um, so that's like definitely a technique that I recommend. And in fact, like if you were to dig into how that, uh, F, that FFHQ or what the Flickr faces model is, those are all aligned around the eyes. So every person's eyes are in the exact same location in their data set, which is great because then when it animates, the eyes basically stay pretty static and everything else around them changes. So one technique is to find something that is like a central location that never changes and have everything else change with it, that tends to produce a little bit more of a static like style of art where like you get a better representation of like this bird in particular versus like having things in all the different places is kind of chaotic and like a like style again in particular can't really learn a lot of those things. Okay, so yeah, I was originally thinking about more of the you know old school Mario, so pixel art where you're walking through a level and yeah. so you're, you're guessing that, that that won't do a good job because of uh, th that aspect that you were just talking about. Whereas if I find a game where it's more like a second person or third person view, um, mm. theoretic, like potentially that may be a way of, um, of training something where I could train the world and then. then... <coughs> yeah. Like I think about like a, like a, a third person shooter or whatever, where the gun is always in the same location, like, and then the background is sort of changing. Like that might produce something like this. I think that Mario thing would actually still work too if Mario were in like the same place. Mario would stay static and everything else around it would 
change. Okay. And then it's just how much change. And I don't really know. I haven't, I feel like I haven't seen anyone do pixel art yet with style game, but like kind of those things that I think would be cool and I know people on the internet would love it. Well, I, I'll probably be debugging it in the channel then. <laughs> cool, awesome. I have a question. Yeah, go for it. What is the, the pickle? Like, what is in it? Like, is it settings? Is it also associated with the style GAN 2 only? Does it work in other models? And then um, I have a question about latent spacewalk movies after that. Yep, one second. So, um, yeah, so uh, what is in that pickle file? Uh, what is in that pickle file are all of these things. So um, I think we talked about this maybe in week one of the class, but basically inside of these models exists a ton of layers. And in each one of these layers is a thing we call a weight and a bias. So if you were to, you can't actually even crack open a pickle file. It is a zip file essentially, but it like inside of it is a bunch of rows and cells and other things. And they just determine the weights of all these things. So it is specific to StyleGAN 2. Um, you can't really do much with it beyond what is in StyleGAN. Uh, and it's just a bunch of numbers. Um, and honestly, I, I couldn't even tell you what it, what it looked like. Couldn't even read it for you. It's just like a bunch of numbers. Yeah. Uh, and you had a question about latent spaces, right? Yeah, so I really like the latent space videos that come out at the end. I think they're cool. Um, the thing is, you only get one at the end. It would be possible to see one at the 1,000 point, at the 2,000 point, at the 3,000 point, or do you have to stop the model every time to be able to do that? Um, yeah, so, the, so what we'll look at next week is if you download those, mo those pickle files and you upload them to your model um, here, uh, we will be able to produce videos from all of them. Awesome. Um, so I actually would recommend that. They must have recently added this feature. So I would definitely recommend doing this is like actually downloading maybe not every 500 steps, but at least every 1,000 steps and uploading them here um, into your model. And then I'll show you next week how to actually create uh, some animations from those. Cool. What other questions do we have? Moises, go for it. Yeah, I guess anything for the, by the last week of class with new stuff that is coming out of runway, any feedback or, or strategies to work on those new features? Um, yes, I don't, I, they are pretty quiet about what they're working on um, until you're part of their betas. So I just, I know they're gonna do the web app. Um, I don't know if the web app is gonna come with different features. One thing I will say actually, so I can pull this up. Um, uh, the web app for training does have a little bit of a different interface. Um, let me see if I can log in here, yeah. So if I go to models, they change this interface pretty frequently. So I actually don't know where my trainings are. Um, so when you do a training in here, I think they must have eliminated where this was. Um, but when you do training inside there on their app, you actually get a little chart for the FID score and some other things. It's pretty similar to what's in the app, but you get a little bit of a different interface. Um, that might be helpful for some people. Again, like I don't, I try not to get people to obsess over the FID scores too much, but if you are interested in it, they, get a little, they give you a little chart of how it works. So you could look at that. Um, yeah, I was thinking about the hosting. I think they released something about hosting um, models and either something about projections, like doing projections instead of one runway. Oh, so there is, so um, yes, yeah, so there is a way to do projection. In, so someone basically uploaded a projection model um, into this, which I don't have in front of me right now. Um, and I've been meaning to do, oh, here it is. Um, so yeah, so we could actually look at maybe doing this for you, for everybody next week too. Um, basically, one of the things that you'll also find out is that um, within runway, there are ways to, customize your own models. So once you've trained a style gam model, um, you can do some things like you could uh, bring in your own style gam to, to projector. And projection is, um, let me see if I can make this work really quickly. It's kind of a slow process, but let me do this while I'm, while everyone is here asking me questions, let me get this set up. Um, projection is a way of 
projecting an, an image that is not in your data set into your model and find the closest approximation of that image in your model. Um, that might not make any sense right now, but let me just get this set up and run. Um, and I'll explain it in a, when, when this is up and running. Um, and once we see it working, let me just grab an image from here. It's my desktop. Yeah, so let's, uh, so this is an image of um, Harrison Ford from Blade Runner. So let's just add this in here. So I'm gonna run this. Um, I'll come back to this, but yeah, we could. So like next week, actually, there's a couple options. So like one, I definitely wanna do just showing you how to set things up with P5.js. Um, I know there's been questions around like, could I hook this up to like something like a stock market ticker, that sort of thing. Um, we could also look at an example like this. Um, I can show you how to basically do this with your own model. Um, so we'll just sort of see, I mean, if people have like things they really, really wanna do next week, um, beyond the regular P5.js stuff, like let me know. Um, you know, with an hour and a half, we don't have a lot of time, but like I could also record some videos and just sort of post them on how to do certain things. Um, what is this like for you? There's also like next week in the style again class, I'm gonna do a projection through CoLab. So that'll also be an option. So like there's, um, there are lots of models that get added every, you know, every couple of weeks, there's a new model that gets added to Runway. Um, and we'll talk about maybe a little bit next week also just like how to find new models and like what to do with them when you're, when you're playing with them. Um, I know someone added like the, the first order motion model got added to Runway recently and that was pretty cool. It like gives you sort of like a, you can track like uh, your face um, that's per perfectly set up. I think did someone add the 3D in painting model to that as well? Um, I think I saw that maybe someone added 3D in painting. This is depth estimation. Um, there is a like the cool like I always call them the fart apps, which is like, what's the new machine learning model that's popular for the next two or three weeks? Uh, the one that is really popular right now is what's called 3D in painting, which you feed it a, uh, a static uh, 2D image and it generates like a pseudo 3D environment. Like not that much, it generates like a little like depth camera type of thing or just like some additional space to it. Um, if someone hasn't put that in here, I'm sure it'll be in here like in the next week or two. Um, that's sort of the one that everyone's playing with right now. Um, but yeah, usually models get added to this like relatively frequently. Um, so there's always new stuff in here. That sort of like exists outside of Runway because that's like, Runway is the platform and then other people upload models to this themselves. So this is generating, we'll see what it produces in a minute. If I wanna make a model, um, I don't know what it's called exactly, but like there are ones where, you know, you type something in and then it spits out an image. Like, is that, can you do that in Runway or do you also have to do it through P5.js or some other, other? Uh, uh, I have, so, well, there's two things here. So it's like one, if you, do you mean the attention GAN model, which is the model we looked at in the first week, which is like you feed in a sentence of like a dog through the ball and you get a dog playing with the ball? Or are you just saying like, I want to put in text and I want to get generated image from that? I'm on mute. Um, so, like, I started collecting data set of lamps, and if I, um, like, I was thinking if I put in, like, it's like, oh, like, what's your mood? Or, like, you put in, you know, a text and it spits out, like, a different lamp every time. Like, that, something like that. Yeah, so something like that, if you were just to use a StyleGAN model, you would use P5.js to, like, manage the text generation and basically what you would want to do is you'd want to like create and well look, this is maybe what i was going to think about doing for next week is just like take some input of data and convert it to a format that would then generate an image and basically what you would need to do is you would need to like take that text string that someone is typing in find a way to either randomize it or like take the letters and produce a number out of that and then turn that number into the array that you need for the image so if it's if the it's just random or like different that's doable um but if you want to actually like i want a brown dog like that is going to be like a whole nother level like that's outside of runway for sure cool uh this is the slowest model on earth which is why i might not do it for us next week um i can show you how this works but it is super slow um this takes like hour or it doesn't take hours but it takes like minutes it takes like 10 minutes it takes like 10 minutes to produce an image out of this um Basically, let me just find it. I mean, I'll find a clear example of this. Um, oh, actually, you know what? I have one on my website. Um, let me just go there. Or actually, you know what? Even better. Uh, let's go to Slack 
and let's go to the general channel. Um, I uploaded this as a sample yesterday. Yeah, here's the projection example. Um, so this is basically, what is this thing doing? This thing is uh, finding the closest approximation to this photo in the faces model. Um, and it does this by sort of like, it picks a random spot and then it like matches them. And as it, it slowly moves to the right place where the model is. So long story short, like this goes on for like minutes um, while it tries to find the best example. Um, this is sort of where, this is the closest Harrison Ford inside of StyleGAN. This is like dirt cheap or like budget, budget version Harrison Ford. Um, so basically this model is supposed to do that in runway. Um, and, oh, there you go. Oh, it actually found that guy. It did, it found something that looks just like him, right? Kind of. Um, so this is a super slow, this took 180 seconds. What is that, three minutes? This is like one of the slowest runway models I've ever seen. Because it's doing that calculation of like, how different is this image, how different is this image and finding it. Um, so what you could do is like, in like a little bit of time, I think we, like you could, basically clone this version and use your own StyleGAN model and find your own images inside that StyleGAN model. Um, so like if you're doing really abstract, like Freya Buckler stuff, um, you'd find like very weird images inside this that was supposed to be the, the rep best representation of someone's face. Um, it would work, uh, it would be pretty weird. Um, we could look at stuff like that if you're interested. Um, that would basically show you how to like actually make one of these models, um, how to make one of these, model, these models directly in, in Runway if you're interested. Um, that's a possibility. I might just record a video for that too, if you are interested. Yeah, Larry, right, go ahead. Uh, is there such thing as too large of a data set? There is in Runway. Yeah, in Runway, like I think they cap your your upload size at like 500 megabytes. Um, so like you can't upload anything bigger than that, which would be like in JPEGs is probably like maybe 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 images in, in JPEG size. Um, but yeah, it's uh, outside of that, no. like. There are people who are training StyleGAN models on 100 gigabytes of images um, on a server. Um, there's probably, there's certainly diminishing returns over a certain size. Like I would say over 20K, you're definitely getting diminishing returns. Sure. Yeah. 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 April, go ahead. A uh, quick question. How did Esteban's like Wes Anderson thing turn out or did he not run it? Uh, he did run it. It turned, it turned out kind of messy. Um, I don't want, like, he, we were just messing around, like, and he, I recommended that he try it, and we were just sort of see, this is what it turned out to look like. Um, oh, this, gosh, yeah. This actually might be a mode collapse. We were trying to figure out if this is a mode uh -huh. collapse or just because the data set was too diverse, um, that it just didn't know what to produce. I kind of think this is a mode collapse because these three images kind of look the same. Um, these two kind of look the same. Like, I think this is a mode collapse. Like, that's how I would guess. But it, I would also, like, when he showed me the data set, I was like, yeah, this, that's not going to work. It's just going to, like, turn to mush. So he could have um, rerun it and it still do something different? It would do something different. Um, so actually, sorry, where was I with Alana's work um, or Alana's work? So Alana also has been, so Alana was also in my class in January and then also is taking my StyleGAN deep dive. And she did this model, um, which I also think is either a mode collapse or not. I don't really even know. Um, I think it's a... I want to say it's a mode class, but like, it's still kind of cool. Like, it just looks like really noisy nature colors types of things. Um, but again, it's like, I bet if she reran this, it would it would turn into whatever she wanted it to. She's really into birding and other things, so she has all these like beautiful bird data sets. Um, so I think there could be a lot of a lot of stuff that would work. But again, mode collapse happens fairly frequently. Like, it probably happens to me about twenty percent of the time. Um, so if it does happen to you, don't freak out. If it does happen to you and you're like, I'm really mad that I paid money for this, let me know. I have a bunch of extra credits that we can generate a model for you. Um, but yeah, it's like, don't don't feel defeated if mode collapse happens to you because it happens to everyone, literally everyone. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, don't feel defeated. This This stuff is hard for sure. Especially when you're training style again, it's very hard. All right, cool. Um, so why don't we wrap it up for the night? Um, again, this is a really great class. Uh, I hope everyone gets to train some stuff. Um, if you are struggling with either your data set or training, 
let Lear or I know, and we're happy to help you out. Um, either guide you through the process or just help process some data. Um, we're happy to do whatever. Cool. All right. See everybody next week. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.